you stand with me as we go before the Lord in a word of prayer? But listen to what uh, it says in the book of Luke, chapter number two, beginning in verse number four. So Joseph went down from the town of Nazareth to Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in the manger because there was no room for them at the end. Let's pray. Father, we just give you thanks and praise today. One, that we could be gathered in your house, and two, that we can worship you. We thank you that you stepped down from heaven into this world. We thank you for all that it means for each one of us. And Lord, help us to worship you this morning because of who you are and what you do. We'll give you thanks. We give you praise. We give you glory and honor. And we do it all in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. 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 Let's worship this morning. Hallelujah. Joy, unspeakable. 
clap offering this morning. Take a moment, say hello to someone that you haven't greeted yet today. Let them know that you're happy to see them. Wish them a Merry Christmas, and then you may be seated. Good morning. We're so excited to have all of you here with us today. Merry Christmas. It is officially Christmas week. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, just a few announcements for you real quick. Um, guys, again, this week, if you could meet with Ron Dobson right after service, he would like to uh, meet with you real quick right up here. So immediately following the service, if you can just scoot on up here uh, and check in with him. He wants to go over a couple things with you uh, from last week's quick check-in. So if you are willing to do that, that would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, Christmas cards. There's a table in the back on either side. So please make sure that if you are doing Christmas cards, you get those laid out today and Christmas Eve will be the last times that you have to lay out your Christmas cards. So if you're planning on doing that, get those done, get them turned in. Also, uh, please stop by the table and pick up your Christmas cards. Uh, whether you have chosen to participate or not, there are cards there for you, so go enjoy them um, and be blessed by the well wishes of your brothers and sisters in Christ. And finally, Christmas Eve service is fast approaching. Isn't that crazy? It's so exciting. This Saturday is um, our Christmas Eve service at 7 p.m. It is a candlelight communion service. It is also a family service, so we encourage you, don't leave the kids at home. Don't worry about finding a babysitter. Bring them along. It's always a really um, beautiful service. We turn the lights down, and it's just all the Christmas lights. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's a great moment to just pause and remember and celebrate the birth of our Savior together. And so we encourage you, make plans, be a part of that, invite someone, um, and, and join us during that time. We thank you and we praise you. Um, Lord, for what you're doing in our service. Amen. Stand with me. We're going to go back into worship. God is so good. Amen. And I, I was thinking as we were singing that last song, joy, unspeakable joy. Aren't you glad that there's joy in the Lord that's not based upon your circumstance? It's not based upon how you deem it should go or any of those things. It's joy because it's Jesus. Amen. And uh, I'm so thankful for that gift today. Father, we worship you again. Father, and just thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here. Not only to be here, but to worship you. Because God, you're worthy. You're worthy of our praise. You're worthy of the song that we sing, the life that we live, the thoughts that we think. Father, you are worthy. And so we just pray that as we take time to continue to reflect on this season, reflect on your birth. Father, we just ask you, Lord, would you just show up in such a mighty and real way? For those who are gathered in person, for those who are joining us online, Father, would you invade our space this morning as we fix our eyes to you? Be blessed. We thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping who angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch are keeping this this is Christ our King whom shepherds guard and angel sing haste haste to bring him Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. Oh. 
This, this is Christ the King. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe. We thank you for the child. We thank you, Father, for the hope, the peace, the joy in our heart. Oh, God, we just worship you this morning. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Worthy of our praise. Worthy of our praise.
come, let us adore. Oh, come, let us adore. God, we worship you this morning. We just come to worship and adore you because you're worthy. We just come to worship and adore you, Father, because we can. Because there was a place that you physically sent your son Jesus to to be born. To come and live his life. To die on a cross. To resurrect again. And to ascend into heaven where he is right now, alive, ever interceding for those who love him and are called according to his name and purpose. So Father, we just take this moment before we do anything else and we just adore you. We just worship you because you're worthy. And we thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit here this morning. we continue in in our service we're going to end the singing but father we're going to continue to worship and adore you as we get into your word this morning would you prepare our heart for that word as it gets ready to come forth would you prepare it lord because you call it in in your word you call it uh the, the word is a seed and so father would you prepare our heart this morning to receive that seed would you make it fertile ground so that we can learn and grow in who you are because you love us so much that you sent Jesus, not just to rescue us, but also to transform us. God, we want to be transformed today. We don't want to check church off of a box or a to-do list, but we want to leave your presence different than when we came in. So God, would you do that right now for each one of us? Lord, we'll thank you and we'll praise you and we'll give you glory and we'll give you honor because you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord one more clap offering this morning. He's worthy. And then you may be seated. You may be seated. We're going to go ahead and dismiss our kids at this point. Those from pre-K through sixth grade, you are dismissed to head back to your class. Your teachers are anxiously awaiting your arrival. And you can head back now. For the rest of you, you can direct your attention up to the screen.
It's on page 944. Well, we're continuing in our Heart of Christmas series that we've been doing this year. And just want to encourage you one more time. I know my wife already mentioned it, but we have our Christmas Eve service coming up this Saturday at 7 o'clock. On Sunday morning, one week from today, it's Christmas morning. We will not be gathering together corporately. We just encourage you to enjoy that day with your friends and family. There will be uh, on, on Facebook that morning at 1030. Uh, we put together a Christmas message for you and it will play. We do have have a DVD available. If you do not have internet access, if you do not have the ability to join us online, there are a few of these in the back. You can get one on your way out at the information table. For the rest of you, it'll be available uh, on our website. It'll be available on our YouTube channel. It'll be available on our Facebook page, and so you can catch it there. Uh, But we're just really excited and so, so glad that you're able to be here. Jesus was born to bring the gifts of hope, peace, joy and love to each one of us which is really the reason for the season amen and so this this uh this christmas we've been taking a look at the heart of christmas kind of peeling back the layers of everything that is surrounding uh, this holiday but really to get to the core really get to the meaning of what uh, christmas really is and at the heart of christmas is the greatest gift of all and that's the gift of love and god has that for each and every single one of us. And so as we get into the word today, we just hope that you're encouraged and you're strengthened. Thank you. Good to see our guests and our visitors that are here today. We're so glad that you were able to join us. Uh, But listen, let's be honest. When you go around to maybe the next celebration, maybe the next party that you're attending, uh, we're going to celebrate and and, and we're going to assuredly this year will be a gift that you receive that you don't know how to respond to anybody ever had one of those occurrences happen you got a gift and you just didn't know how to respond to it anybody just just me and Dave okay no there's a couple of you Uh, I remember one time I received a gift and uh, the person who gave me the gift said this is something that I got for somebody else and I lost it so I thought I'd give it to you this year Right? And you probably have some other stories that you can share. It's that gift that you're like, oh. Right? So real quick before we get in, this is not spiritual at all. Okay? I'm just, we just, these are free tips for this morning. Real quick. We're just going to take three minutes. It's lighthearted. You're allowed to laugh and enjoy church just for a moment. But I'm going to give you a couple, uh, how to have some Christmas gift gratitude. All right? Number seven, you could say something like this. Well, now there's a gift. That, that might be a way to respond, all right? Number, number six, and this I think is still a thing. Maybe it's not, so, you know, it's just what it is. I didn't know there was a Chia Pet tie, right? Oh, and it clips on too, right? So you can just pull out some positive things. Number, number five, I, I always wanted one of those. Could you jog my memory? What's it called again? That, that might be an appropriate way for you to respond if you need to. Uh, number four, you know what? I'm going to find a really special place to put this. That, that, that might be useful for you. I, I'm not quite sure. Number three, you know what? You don't see craftsmanship like this anymore. That, that might be a, a fitting way to respond. Number two, it's such an interesting color. I don't know, that might be of use to you, I'm not quite sure. And then finally, your, your, your best piece of Christmas gift gratitude that I can offer this morning. No, you shouldn't have. No, really, you shouldn't have. So if you find that fitting at all, that might be helpful for you. But you know what, listen, no matter where you go, I want you to know that there is some love that's being poured out. There is some love that's being poured out, and it's the greatest gift if you've never experienced it. It really is the great, greatest gift. I, I want to talk this morning about a gift that you don't have to rehearse a response to. It's the greatest gift that's ever been given, and it's the time in which it was presented in an earthly fashion when God sent his son to be born. It was an expression of his unfailing And his relentless, say it with me, love. His love is a gift that is thoughtful. It's a gift that is priceless. 
and it's a gift that's timeless. It's, it's thoughtful because it meets our greatest need. It's priceless because it could never be purchased apart from Christ's sacrificial blood. And it's timeless because the grace of God never ends. Really at the center and the heart of Christmas that you and I find is this gift of love. The first point that I want to make this morning is God's gift was right on time. Have you ever received a present or a gift from someone and, and you could not believe how perfect the timing was? And maybe it wasn't a physical gift. Maybe it was a word of encouragement. Maybe it was a, somebody who just said they were praying for you. But it came at just the right time in just the right circumstance. Maybe because you were going through something. It was a, a bad time. It was a difficult time. The book of Galatians talks about the timing of Christmas in chapter number four. So Galatians chapter number four, I'm going to read two verses and it's verse number four and five. You can go the E version or the tree version. It doesn't much matter to me. Galatians chapter number four, I'm going to read verses four and five. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Father, this morning as we get into your word, would you just open it? Your word says that it's alive and it's active. So, Father, we're not just reading a passage or a portion. We are reading the living word. So let it transform us this morning. Let my preaching not be done with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of your power. Because, Lord, we need you. We don't need me. So, Father, we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. From the moment that creation became broke by sin... God began to unfurl his plan to restore and rescue all that he had made. The Bible, from the very beginning to the very end, is the account of his faithfulness, motivated by love, partnering with the Son and the Holy Spirit to draw his creation to him. Paul wrote that when Jesus came and was born to Mary, the fullness of time had come. It was just the right moment in time for Jesus to be born. How did God come up with that time? I don't know. The Bible doesn't specifically tell us, but we know that at just the right moment, Jesus was born. We started what, three weeks ago talking about Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah chapter nine, number 9. For unto us a child is born, unto us a, a, a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Almighty God, Prince of Peace, Everlasting Father. And then they had to wait some 750 years. Why? I don't understand. But God's timing was perfect. And when that time had come, with whatever criteria God saw fit, he had, he allowed, excuse me, Jesus to be born to the Virgin Mary at just the right time. It was the right moment in history to send his son to make a way for the world. Because of love, God was not content to sit back and watch his creation suffer forever. He went to great lengths to be with us and to make us a part of his family once again. Tracy Howell of, of Len Leonard, Texas, found a unique way of showing her husband both love and support in his daily life. On December 1st in 2020, she shared the following Facebook post, which racked up hundreds of thousands of shares. This is what she wrote. Clifford and I have been married for almost 41 years, and I have made his lunch every working day since day one. On occasion, I would join him on the job site and have lunch with him. He made the comment once that lunch tasted better 
when you share it with someone you love. Soon after that, while fixing his sandwich one night, I realized I wouldn't be able to join him the next day, so I took a bite out of his sandwich before putting it in his lunchbox. When he got home, because this was before cell phones, he commented that someone took a bite out of his sandwich. I told him I did it since I couldn't join him for lunch. I took the bite so he knew I was with him. I continued to do this frequently unless I made him tuna. <laughs> he commented and said, you saw me and you joined me and it was good. Tracy wanted her husband to know that she wasn't just thinking about him, but she was actually joining him. He went on later to put a comment under that Facebook post and said that sandwich was the best tasting sandwich I had ever tasted. What is perhaps most amazing is that when Jesus came, he came to meet us exactly where we are. He came to meet us exactly where we are. He didn't come and said, everyone come to me and be like me and do this and do that and follow this rule and don't do that and don't go. He said, here I am. And he came and met us right where we were. Right in the moment. He was born under the law of God to redeem mankind. In doing so, his perfect life met the requirements that the law demanded where you and I fail Jesus succeeds what you and I can't do he did completely where you and I can't measure up Jesus is the fullest fulfillment the late J.I. Packer who pastored the church for many years wrote this, adoption is the highest privilege that the gospel offers, higher even than justification. To be right with God, the judge, is a great thing, but to be loved and cared for by God, the Father, is even greater. Which brings us to our second point, you and I are loved into the family. According to Galatians 4 that we just read a moment ago, the full expression of God's love was demonstrated through Jesus Christ and our ability to be adopted into the family. You and I became children of God and brothers and sisters in Christ. We are all given the privileges of, of sonship with God our Father. Many of us live our lives every day missing the fact that God loves us. I'm going to say that one again. Many of us live our lives every day missing the fact that God loves us. And even if we have an, an understanding of it, many times we miss out on the fullness of that love. Can I tell you this morning, you don't have to measure up. You don't have to keep trying. God loves you. Just as you are, right where you are. Don't miss it. When we do miss it, when we miss the fact that we've been adopted into his family, we have, the hard we have a hard time loving ourselves, and then in turn we have a hard time loving others. When we miss the, the idea, when we miss, the, uh, uh, miss out on the understanding of who God is, how he really feels about us, then we can't fully love ourselves and we can't love each other. And God calls you and I to love each other. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter number 1. It's the very next book in the Bible. We're in Galatians. Go one book more to the book of Ephesians. Nine forty-six for those of you using the Bible in the chair. 
Ephesians chapter number one, and I'm going to start reading in verse number three. Ephesians chapter number one, and I'm going to start reading in verse number three. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment and to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who are first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you, will, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Understanding that you and I are loved into the family, and we read this portion as Paul writes this church, excuse me, writes this letter to the church in Ephesus, and we're reading the very beginning, the, the, the uh, initial hello as he writes this letter, and I love how he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's always giving God praise, no matter what he's about to do. You'll see it at the beginning of every letter that he writes. Even in Corinthians, where he quickly changes gears and starts saying, Hey, shape up. But he worships God through it, and then he goes in to encourage him. And one thing I want to point out before I continue is, before I continue in with this, but he talks here about being predestined and being chosen before the beginning of time. And I want to just take a moment and pause on that because I don't want this to cause confusion. Who's the author, excuse me, who's the audience that Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus? That's the audience. That's in whom the, the letter is written to. They were not Jewish. They were Gentiles. We know that God had a chosen people, and that's the nation of Israel. And then Jesus came to fulfill that law and establish a new covenant. And in the book of Acts, we see Peter have a vision, right? And the sheet comes down and these animals, and he says, go and eat. And Peter says, I'm not going to eat any unclean God, thing, God. I've never done that. I'll never do it. And he says, what? Don't call something unclean that I've created. And we see this transition, we see this thing happen in the life of the apostles where God reveals he's not just come for a group, but he's come for all. And so as Paul then begins his ministry and he goes around and he preaches the gospel, these people have heard that he's the God of the Israelites. He's heard that he's the God of this group of people. And Paul says, listen, just like he's the God of them, he's the God of you. And just like he chose them from the beginning, he's chosen you from the beginning. You're not disqualified. You're not less than. You're not outside of the arms of his reach. And so when he says that, you know, you were chosen before the, the creation of the world and you were predestined to be adopted, you were predestined. Why? Because God so loved the world. It's God's desire that every human being come to the saving knowledge of who he is. We don't believe that God said, you're going to go to heaven, you're going to go to heaven, you're going to go to heaven. Nope, nope, nope. Yep, yep, yep. Nope, yep, nope, nope. We don't believe that. For God so loved the world. Who is he writing to? The Gentiles. They had this thing. We're not good enough. 
we weren't chosen, we don't get that, we don't qualify, we're unlovable. All of those things the enemy puts in our brains too, maybe just not under this topic, right? Paul says, no, 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 just like they were chosen, you were chosen. Just like God loved them from the foundation of the world, he loved you from the foundation of the world. Understand what's being written here. I just don't want it to be confusing. He's chosen you to be what? Holy and blameless in his sight. Because in love. In love. God loves you so much that he doesn't want you to stay the way you are. He desires you to be holy. He desires you to be blameless. He desires you to be everything that his word declares you are. And so through the gift of Jesus Christ, as we read back in Galatians chapter number four, in the fulfillment of time, at just the right moment, in love, God sent Jesus so that you and I could be holy, so that you and I could be blameless in his sight. And we can't do it on our own. I can't be holy in and of myself. But if you skip down to that verse number 14, when it talks about the Holy Spirit who comes as a deposit will guide us. Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit. And there's the two, two distinct times that we're talking about the Holy Spirit. One is when we ask Christ into our life to be our Lord and our Savior, we get this deposit of the Holy Spirit. We get this, we're marked with the seal, he says here in Ephesians, which is the Holy Spirit. It ensures that we'll in inherit eternal life. It's just a down payment, if you will. It's just a deposit of what's to come. Now, there's the second part, the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's a, that's a different encounter. That's something that you and I should be seeking all of the time. And, and we should be wanting more of God because God always has more for you and I. But God loves us so much. Not only did he send his son, Jesus... And then Jesus dies, resurrects on the earth for 40 days and then ascends into heaven, but then gives us the Holy Spirit. So we don't have to be alone. So we don't have to do it on our own. That's a demonstration of his love. Verse number 13 says that you and I are chosen to receive hope and salvation. Verse number 9 says that God's way and His will are made known to you and I as just like a father would share something with his child. That's how much He loves us. He didn't just say, here's Jesus, and then not tell us how to have that encounter, how to have the relationship, but He gives us all the tools that you and I need to experience the fullness of who He is. It's only made possible by the arrival of Jesus at just the right time, in just the right place. And the last point for today is love freely received is freely given. What the, maybe the biggest tragedy about the oversight of God's love If you and I have not experienced the grace of God, it's, offer, it's difficult to offer the grace of God. I said it a mo couple of moments ago, if you've not experienced its love, His love, then it's hard to love others. If you've not experienced His grace, it's hard to offer grace. If you haven't experienced His mercy, it's hard to offer His mercy. Because we can give what we've been freely given. You don't have to earn his love. He already loves you. You don't have to earn forgiveness because through the blood of Christ, we've been forgiven. We just have to ask for it to be applied. We don't have to earn these things, these qualities, the hope, the joy, the peace. We don't have to earn them. They're given freely for those who will call upon his name. 
We said this last week talking about joy. Joy is in relationship with Jesus. Hope, hope's in relationship with Jesus. We find peace in a relationship with Jesus. And there's no greater love than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. And we see God sending Jesus to lay down his life for mankind. One of the most famous passages in the Bible about love helps us to understand God's feeling towards us and the way we should feel about our spouse, our children, our friends, our neighbors. And it comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Turn there with me very quickly and we're going to go look at those scriptures very fast. Page 932 if you're using a Bible from the chair. It's called the love chapter. I read it at almost every wedding that I perform because it talks about love. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 1, and we'll read down through verse number 8. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but I have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I do not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And we see Jesus being the ultimate example of love. Amen? So watch what happens and read this with me and follow along in verse number four. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy. Jesus does not boast. Jesus is not proud. He is not rude. He is not self-seeking. He is not easily angered. He keeps no records of wrong. Jesus does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Jesus always protects, always trusts, always hopes, Always persevere. Jesus never fails. Now put our name in there. It's tough to measure up, isn't it? But Jesus is the the, the perfect picture of God's love for you and I. That's how we can take the word love out and insert Jesus and it fits perfectly because he's the ultimate example of love, of God's love and how much he loved the world. You and I can get caught up in all kinds of things, even good things and miss the whole point if love is not the motivating factor. Love like we have been given from God should cause us to be patient and kind with one another. It should cause us to avoid being envious of one another or proud. Love should drive us to honor others and to keep a cool head. Love is present when we avoid evil and rejoice with good. Listen, that's the kind of love that you and I have received from God through Jesus Christ. Listen, let's, I, I did something, and again, it's, lo, it's lighthearted, so please don't get mad at me. I changed some, verse, uh, some words in this portion of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 13. Follow along with me. We, we took what the Bible said, and I translated it to maybe some common occurrences that you and I might have happen to us at Christmas. If I decorate my house perfectly with bows and strands of twinkling lights and shiny ornaments, but I do not have love, I'm just a decorator. If I work hard in the kitchen baking Christmas cookies, preparing gourmet meals and arranging a beautifully adorned table for mealtime, but I do not have love, then I'm just a cook. If I work at a soup kitchen or carol at the nursing home and I give all I have to charity, but I don't have love, then it profits me nothing. 
If I trim the spruce with shimmering angels and crocheted snowflakes, and I attend a myriad of holiday parties, and I sing in the church choir cantata, but I do not focus on Christ, then I've just missed the point. Love stops the cooking to hug the child. Love sets aside the decorating to kiss a spouse. Love is kind even when we're hurried and tired. Love does not envy another's home that has coordinated its Christmas china with its table linens. Love does not yell at the kids to get out of the way, but is thankful that there are kids to get in the way. Love does not give only to those who are able to give in return, but rejoices in giving to those who cannot. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. I don't know who said this next quote, but I'll give it to you anyway. It says, toys will break, Pearl necklaces will be lost, golf clubs will rust, but giving the gift of love will endure forever. Will you stand with me as we close? In Luke chapter 1, we see the angel come to Mary and let her know that she's going to have a child. In Matthew chapter 1, we see an angel appear to Joseph and let him know that Mary is going to have a child. In Luke chapter number 2, I started the service with it, and we actually read about the birth of Jesus in verses 4 through 8. Sorry, four through seven. And in verse number eight, we see an angel appear to the shepherds in the field at night, announcing the birth of this baby. And they hurry off and they find Mary and Joseph and the baby. They worshiped. And then they left that place telling others because they were excited and realizing that everything that had been told to them in the field is exactly what they found. The next thing that we see is Mary and Joseph taking the baby, baby to the temple eight day, on the eighth day so that there could be the ceremonial cleansing for Mary and for the baby. We really don't hear much about him until two years old when the wise men come and visit. They bring their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And these men and their caravan traveled all this time. And we don't know exactly, but we know it was a long time. And they show up at the door and it says they lay those gifts before the young boy, approximately two years old, and they worship him. And then we get a quick snippet of Jesus' life at 12. His teaching in the temple. Mary and Joseph and the rest of their family leave and they're like, where's Jesus? And I thought you were watching him. No, I thought you were watching him. So they go back and find him teaching. And then we hear nothing about him again until his public ministry starts at approximately 30 years old. We just get these little snippets. And yet we recognize that Jesus, the, the birth of Jesus Christ is the greatest gift ever given to mankind. 
You and I don't need all the details. We don't need to know what time he went to bed. We don't need to know how many hours he spent with Joseph in the shop learning how to be a carpenter. We don't need to know how many times Mary said to the rest of the kids, can't you just be more like Jesus? Because we recognize the value of the gift. We recognize the, va <clears throat> excuse me, the value of the gift of that baby. We recognize you and I have the privilege of the word of God, amen. We, you and I have the privilege so we can read about the value. We, we understand the reason behind him coming and, and the fulfillment and we, we can read back. You know, hindsight being 2020, right? We, we get it. But this year, I challenge you to pause to make sure you get it. it it's probably a safe assumption to know that, that if you... If you read the Bible at all, if you've come to church for any amount of time, the, the Christmas scriptures are probably familiar with you in some, to some extent. But this year as we peel back the layers, and I've been saying that since the first Sunday that we've been talking about Christmas, but as we peel back the layers and we really get to the heart, I encourage you to pause. I encourage you to take the moments to understand the value of the gift. My wife and I still have things that my mother gave us when we got married. My mom's passed now. She's been gone for about 15 years. and She was blessed us with lots of things. Some of those things we needed, some of those things I think she just wanted to get rid of, but we have some things that are still around, and, and you know, it's hard to part with them. Sometimes it's easy, but sometimes it's like, I don't know if I'm ready to part with this yet. And sometimes it's just merely because of who gave us the gift. Sure, I want you to take a moment and value the gift of Jesus. You have the head knowledge, but would you allow that to permeate your heart? Would you allow it not to just be the knowledge of who he is, but ask the Lord to give you an understanding of that value, an understanding of the Son. And through that gift is grace and mercy. Through that gift is love and compassion. Through that gift is truth. But through it all is the love. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me as we close in a word of prayer? Father, this morning we just say thank you. We recognize as we celebrate Christmas, we see the arrival of Jesus as the ultimate gift from you. It's the kind of gift where all we have to do is receive it. Father, today I pray that the love that we receive in our hearts would cause us to live it out every day of the year. Father, that you'd permeate our calendars, our busyness, our stubbornness, and sometimes even our hard-heartedness. Would you permeate that today? 
with the very presence of who you are. We're thankful for this gift of Jesus. We're thankful for the presence of the Holy Spirit. God, we thank you so much for looking down upon creation and not wanting us to stay the way we are. So, Father, we ask your blessing. But, Father, not just your blessing. Help us to be a blessing. Help us to recognize your love, but not just to recognize it, but then to turn around and to give it away freely. To see your grace and your truth and your mercy and not just receive it freely in in and of ourselves, but then to turn around and to give it to others. That we might be the hands and feet of Christ. That we might be the sons and daughters of the Most High God. Father, we thank you. God, we praise you for who you are, for the undeserving gift of Jesus Christ that you've given to mankind. Father, we receive that gift with open arms. We receive that gift with joyful hearts. And to you be the praise and the glory and the honor forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We just want to wish you a very Merry Christmas. I know some of you will be away. You'll be traveling. And this will be our last time together uh, before the holiday. So if that's you, Merry Christmas. We just pray God's richest blessing on you, that you have a great holiday. For those of you that are around, maybe you have family joining you. We'd love to see you on Christmas Eve at 7 o'clock. As my wife mentioned, the lights will be dimmed and we'll just worship. We'll just worship Jesus that night. God bless you. Thanks for being here. Men, if you have a couple of moments, I think Ron's going to transition up. We'd love to meet with you for just a couple of minutes. God bless you. Thanks for coming. Merry Christmas. You are dismissed.